So my name is Thomas Harder. I'm going to um, look at a case study of this groundwater surface water interface. And what I will do is I will um, look at the hydrology and a little bit of the background on this case study, but then also highlight some of the policy and management activities that go into addressing issues around this groundwater surface water interface. I don't want to start without acknowledging the great work of Gus Tolle and Jacob Newman, both students here at University of California, Davis, and at the University of Darmstadt, where uh, Professor Laura Folia is working, who has been working with me on some of the modeling analysis that we're doing. The Scott Valley is a, by California standards, relatively small groundwater basin um, cuddled against the California Oregon border. It is a part of a much larger, relatively mountainous watershed in northwestern California. Um, the Scott River actually flows into the Klamath River. It's a tributary to the Klamath River, which is a watershed um, that um, covers the western half of the Oregon-California border. Um, as most groundwater basins in California, and which is why the Scott Valley is very interesting to uh, many water managers across California, it is an alluvial basin um, nestled into uh, fracture hard rock. This particular one is relatively shallow with sediments that are from 150 to, uh, from 50 to about 150 feet thick in some places, maybe a little bit more. Uh, the Scott River flows in from the south side of the valley and flows out at the northwest side of the valley. It has several tributaries, mostly from the west, west side, where the watershed rises to some of the highest mountains that we have in the California coast range going, coast range going up to 8,000 feet. It is a half million acre watershed. At the valley floor, we have precipitation that's on the order of about 21 inches per year. But that precipitation is very unevenly distributed, which is very different from, say, the humid climates that Ken mentioned in Wisconsin. Our precipitation in California, for those of you that are from the southwest, um, uh, very familiar with that, we have rain um, focused in months, in the winter months between October and April, with very little precipitation, mostly related to thunderstorms um, in the summer. The Scott River has an average annual runoff on the order of close to half a million acre feet per year, which is about five times the amount of consumptive water use in the irrigated agricultural landscape on the valley floor, which takes up about 30,000 acres. Um, the mountain, the interesting thing about the Scott Valley is that unlike many other groundwater basins or many other basins in California, it doesn't really have any surface water storage um, reservoirs. The largest storage reservoir in the Scott Valley are the mountains. It's the snowpack in the mountains surrounding uh, the south and west side of the valley, and that snowpack has a significant influence on stream flow in the Scott River. And the Scott River being one of four major tributaries to the Klamath River, downstream from a large dam on the Klamath River, is a, the Scott River is a very important uh, spawning habitat for both Chinook salmon and coho salmon. Scott River also is being used for irrigation. There are numerous small riparian surface water diversions. There are a couple larger diversions associated with small irrigation districts. The Scott Valley floor, the agriculture is um, almost exclusively pasture and alfalfa, uh, with much of the alfalfa uh, along the uh, streams and the pastures more to the sides of the valley. Um, until the 1970s and throughout much of the 20th century, the irrigation in the Scott Valley was but irrigation with surface water, as you can see in the lower left picture here, uh, which is still the case on most of the pastures that we have in the Scott Valley, shown here in green. But in the 1970s, there was a fairly large-scale conversion to a much more efficient way of irrigating with um, wheel line sprinklers. But in order to do that, uh, the farmers that use these wheel lines, which have to be pressurized, switched from surface water to uh, groundwater drilled wells, and since the 1970s have done so um, mostly in the spring and summer months to um, irrigate about three cuttings of alfalfa. Um, more recently, the wheel lines in many places have been replaced with center pivots. Uh, those are the areas that you see here in blue. 
um, which are even more efficient in the uh, than the wheel lines, but also depend on groundwater for irrigation between April and August. So with that groundwater pumping, as Ken has pointed out, depending on the distance of the well and the hydrogeology, once you start pumping, you start creating a cone of depression near that well. Um, you lower the uh, slope of the water table near the stream, and as a result, um, over time, um, in, uh, you slowly start capturing more and more of that stream water in that well. There are significant dynamics associated with this process. The um, capture of stream water to the well is not instantaneous. It's a time-delayed process. And similarly, when we stop pumping later in the summer, um, the, um, uh, the, that effect is not seen by the river for some time. As a result of the groundwater pumping of this conversion to um, sprinkler and or pivot irrigation, although it's much more efficient than the flood irrigation, because it relies on groundwater pumping, we have seen um, significant decreases in the low stream flows that occur during the dry summer months in August and September. The upper graph shows the stream flows in blue. Um, you can see the precipitation. Those are the dropping green bars here at the top. Um, and here at the bottom, you can see two hydrographs from uh, wells that are near the Scott River. And you can see there are lower water levels in one of those wells as we move into the 1980s and 1990s. It's part of that conversion from surface water fed flood irrigation to groundwater fed sprinkler and center pivot irrigation. Um, overall, there has been really not a change in stream flows in the uh, winter months. We have to look into these summer months to look at average stream flows, which has changed over the last 50 years from about 60 CFS to about 30 CFS on average um, in the months of August and September. Some of that is due to changes in variability in climate of 1940s, 50s, and 60s were relatively wet years compared to the last 20 years, um, the last 10 15 years, we've mostly seen uh, dry years. There are climate uh, interactions, but most of this change, or, or a significant part of this change, is due to groundwater pumping. Because most of these sprinkler and center pivots are near the Scott and along the Scott River, much of the groundwater pumping shown here in blue is happening in those areas. With the net water budget effect being that near the river we're withdrawing over, over an annual average somewhere between 10 and 18 inches of uh, groundwater on average when we balance out recharge from this agricultural landscape with the pumping. The pasture flood area, pasture on the other hand, mostly from surface water, um, has a net annual surplus of uh, inflow to groundwater that is on that same order 10 to 20 inches per year. Much of the recharge happens in the winter months um, with a recharge from pasture also significant in summer months whereas the pumping is focused on these months April, May through August primarily in alfalfa. That has set up agriculture as one of the key players in a struggle between uh, various uh, users of the stream uh, downstream fisheries, both the commercial offshore fishery, uh, salmon offshore fishery, and downstream uh, fisheries associated with Native American tribes, um, have run into, um, into competing interests on this river. Um, and there are a number of policies that speak to a potential um, inter um, intervention on this. Uh, the Endangered Species Act and the coho salmon that's in the uh, in the Scott River is actually listed as a threatened species. The Endangered Species Act um, here is used to control really not groundwater uh, but surface water diversions, which in other places in California actually has led to increased groundwater pumping as the Endangered Species Act has really no reach, no policy reach into the, um, into the groundwater domain and doesn't recognize the connection between groundwater and surface water. Similarly, we have the Clean Water Act, which really focuses on surface water. Uh, the National Clean Water Act focuses on surface water and doesn't reach into groundwater, but has been used here in the Scott Valley uh, to look at the temperature effects that the uh, decrease in base flow in the summer has had on, on the stream 
um, with the temperature effect being directly associated with these lower flows. And so under the Clean Water Act and the Total Maximum Daily Load Program, also called TMDL, the regional water board that is in charge of implementing the Clean Water Act has come up with a temperature TMDL under which uh, the impacts to the stream have to be addressed um, over the next uh, years. Another policy um, that has come about uh, through lawsuits is the public trust doctrine. Uh, we have currently lawsuits pending that argue that the so-called tributary flows that groundwater has to stream flow, which can call base flow, are actually protected under the public trust doctrine to the degree that if the decrease in tributary flows impacts that base flow in a damaging way for the ecosystem, uh, those tributary flows would have to be curtailed in one way or another. Those court cases are still pending, uh, but if that public trust doc doctrine is confirmed, that would be the first case that is actually being applied to quote unquote tributary flows of groundwater to surface water in a, uh, in a court and could have major consequences on how we manage groundwater in that system. Another important policy that has just been passed by the California legislature is the California Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, that management act has explicitly acknowledged the connection between groundwater and surface water. Really the first legislation we have had in the state to acknowledge the connection, the physical connection between groundwater and surface water. The law protects surface water users and ecosystems from groundwater capture through wells but really only after, uh, only those um, effects that have occurred after January 1st of 2015. So for this system, which has seen these effects for a number of years already, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is unlikely to have significant policy consequences. The main impetus comes from the temperature TMDL, and the agency has sought a very collaborative approach, um, trying to bring stakeholders to the table, identify common goals, identify potential range of solutions through scientific analysis and modeling, um, and then select somewhere down the road agreeable management options um, that would be evaluated through modeling initially and through field testing, um, and then implemented in adaptive uh, fashion. Part of this has been integrated hydrologic modeling. Um, integrated meaning that we're modeling not just one compartment of the hydrologic cycle, but all compartments of the hydrologic cycle from precipitation through runoff, stream flow, and lakes, um, or smaller, smaller impoundments through the unsaturated zone and soils in, and including groundwater and aquifers all in an integrated manner to then look at how management practices impact stream flow and groundwater levels. These models um, um, are calibrated and validated through comparison with actual data. Um, very important in these uh, integrated models is to have both stream flow data and groundwater level data available. And as part of this analysis, there are <clears throat> what has come forth is that there are principally four options to address the issues that we have in the Scott Valley. One would be to decrease surface water diversions in the summer. Another one is to increase landscape recharge, particularly in the months prior to the dry season when there is significant amounts of stream flow available, um, or building infrastructure to increase the amount of recharge or surface water storage. And then of course there's the option to reduce groundwater pumping. What we're looking at in the Scott Valley is um, a combination of managed aquifer recharge in the smaller gulches to the east of the river, where we have about 3,000 acre feet of storage, available, subsurface storage available and essentially use those as timed reservoirs. We're also looking into what we call in-lieu recharge and intentional recharge in the agricultural landscape um, by increasing the amount of surface water irrigation and uh, seizing groundwater pumping during times when sufficient stream flow is available in the spring months for irrigating crops near the stream. Another alternative that we're looking at are beaver dams, which would raise stream levels and surrounding water tables um, in the um, spring and early summer months. And what we are looking at is how that would impact the later um, stream flows in the Scott River and whether that has in fact uh, beneficial use to August and September flows. 
the dynamics of the system are very important because we're so focused on late summer flows and there's much that we can do with recharge and additional stream flows um, or beaver dams earlier in the year. We evaluate those scenarios using these computer models looking at changes and increases in summer flows, particularly in the August and September period, um, and uh, use that as a basis for making management decisions. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you, Charlotte.